welcome to the Standing Up to Pots podcast, otherwise known as the Potscast. This podcast is dedicated to educating and empowering the community about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, commonly referred to as POTS. This invisible illness impacts millions and we are committed to explaining the basics, raising awareness, exploring the research, and empowering patients to not only survive, but thrive. This is the Standing Up to POTS podcast. Hello, fellow POTS patients and nice people who care about POTS patients. I'm Jill Brooke, and today we are going to discuss occupational therapy for living better with POTS and related conditions with our guest, the amazing Joanna Beam. Joanna is an occupational therapist, academic fieldwork coordinator, and senior lecturer at Messiah College in the Master of Occupational Therapy program. She is a POTS patient herself, with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, so she's familiar with the challenges we face and is passionate about helping others integrate lifestyle adaptations into their routines so they can live their best lives. Joanna is currently a doctoral student at Northeastern University, where she is studying education with a concentration in curriculum, teaching, leadership, and learning. She is also the Vice President of the Dysautonomia Support Network, which offers lots of great resources for patients by patients with various forms of dysautonomia. So Joanna, I know that you are always busy working to help patients through both your work and your volunteer activities. So thank you for that and for taking time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. So for a little context for our audience, I met you a couple years ago. And when I learned that you were an occupational therapist, I had no idea what that was. I had never heard of it. And when you explained it to me, I wanted to smack my forehead. (laughs) I was like, wow, that sounds so potentially helpful for some of us more severely affected patients who really struggle with some basic activities like grocery shopping, cooking, showering, or all kinds of things like that. And I really felt like somebody should have recommended it to me, especially back in the years when I was so debilitated and barely functioning. So I was kind of annoyed I hadn't heard of it sooner. So I'm very excited for other people to hear about this in case it can help them. So for starters, just the real basics, what is occupational therapy? Well, Jill, I would say occupational therapy is the best known secret in the rehab world. Um, and, and it's, you know, unfortunately, we um, are a little less understood and recognized than our sister rehab professionals of physical therapy and speech therapy. So occupational therapy is a healthcare profession that helps people across the lifespan to do the things they want to and need to do through the therapeutic use of daily activities, which we refer to as occupations. So occupational therapy practitioners enable people of all ages to live life to its fullest by helping them promote health and prevent or live better with injury, illness, or disability. So really our main goal is to help our patients achieve health, well-being, and participation in life through engagement in occupations or activities that they do every day. So could we just share some examples? So like, what are some of these occupations that you're talking about, like specifically? Yeah, so occupations are literally anything you do throughout your day, and we have different categories of them. So the most common one that some people may have heard before are things called ADLs or activities of daily living. So those are things like bathing, dressing, toileting, those types of things, you know, brushing your teeth. We have things called instrumental activities of daily living or IADLs, and those are the higher level activities. So things like grocery shopping, cooking, housework. We also consider school or work an activity or an occupation. Same with social participation and symptom and health management. That's a really important one for POTS patients that I imagine we'll talk about later. Yeah, so this sounds really relevant, especially for those of us who have been severely affected. And I know some of our listeners might just have mild POTS. Maybe they only are a little bit dizzy when they stand up and they're thinking, oh my gosh, trouble with bathing and toileting. That sounds rough. 
But as someone who's been there, yes, you, sometimes you can't believe it's happening to you until it is. So let's take an average POTS patient who has trouble standing up for very long, who maybe gets really dizzy, who maybe has some extreme fatigue. And as you know, there, there's one of these situations that's near and dear to my heart, which is the grocery shopping and cooking situation, because I really believe that you can get in a vicious cycle if you are just too sick and too debilitated to get decent food, then I worry that that can send you into a vicious cycle of getting worse. So what's an example of something you could do for somebody? And let's start with like the grocery shopping world. Yeah. So the really neat thing about OT is that we use many different approaches to intervention. So for example, one of our approaches is remediation. So we're trying to restore a skill that was previously lost. So maybe before POTS, you could go to the grocery store, go, you know, do your thing, get out of there and be fine. But um, we could maybe use a remediation intervention that would help you get back to that potentially. We also use modification or compensation. So this is finding different ways to engage in that same activity that makes it easier for you or allows you to still be successful in it. So an example of that would be, okay, well, you're going to go to the grocery store, but you're going to be in a wheelchair so that you can still go to the grocery store. You can go shopping, but you can sit. Or maybe you'll use one of those motorized scooters that they have at the grocery store. That's something that I did often as, as a patient myself. And then we also use a prevention technique too. So that's kind of preventing things from getting worse or preventing problems from happening. So that could be kind of working on your routine. Okay, well, if you know that you're really tired, if you're like me, it's a late afternoon time period that's very difficult for me, then I'm going to not go grocery shopping during that time because I know that my symptoms are going to be really bad and I'm not going to be able to finish my grocery shopping or I'm going to pass out or I'm going to have to lay down in the middle of the floor, right, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many different ways we can approach it. So depending on the person and depending on their severity of POTS, what other comorbidities they may have and what their goals are, depends on what approach we would take. But what I find myself is that modification and compensation are usually my first go-to because it's going to take a while and it may not be possible to restore that skill depending on your POTS, right? But we can always find better, easier ways to do the thing you want to do. So for example, instead of standing in line at the grocery store, because I don't know about you, but that's very hard for me, why don't we do self-checkout because then I can get through the line faster. There's lots of different ways to do things differently to make you successful. So OT really analyzes the activity and says, okay, what part about this is really hard? Is it the standing in line? Is it the driving to the grocery store? Is it the walking around? Is it bending over and coming back up when you're trying to pick things up off shelves? What parts are hard? And then let's really focus in on those pieces through what we call activity analysis and then decide the best way to approach it. So OT can go really big picture, but then we also really narrow in on the specific steps of the activity that you're having trouble with. So I realized that I jumped in with probably the most complex, difficult thing, but let's start with one that's more basic. So for example, I think a lot of us, especially in the beginning, struggle with just getting our compression stockings on especially if some of us have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or joint hypermobility. And so our joints can come out of place with all that pulling and tugging. So is that something you could help someone with? And what would that look like? Definitely. So that's something that I would take a compensatory approach towards. I also have difficulty with my compression socks. So depending on what joints you were struggling with, so is it your distal fingers? Is it your wrist? Is it your thumbs? Like what exactly is the problem when you're pulling them on? And then we can figure out, okay, do we need some figure eight splint, right? Those are some splints that you can get that can help to keep your joints from hyperextending. Do we need a compression sock donner? It's a piece of adaptive equipment that helps you put on your socks easier so you're not actually using your fingers to pull them up. You're actually holding on to handles and pulling it. So it's much better for your joints. So we would use a bunch of joint protection techniques, like really making sure that we're using good body mechanics, that we're not 
putting a lot of stress on our little joints, but we're putting stress on our bigger joints, a full grasp instead of individual finger movements to protect your fingers. We would also maybe recommend if you're dizzy when you're bending over to put them on to lay in bed and to put them on in bed. And if you're able to bring your foot up towards, you know, bending your hip and bending your knee, you can put them on that way as well. So we would probably change the way you would put those on. Right. Beautiful. Okay. Can I throw you another one? Yeah, go for it. Showering. I think most of us hate showering. Some of us have even fainted in the shower. I feel like it's a little dangerous, if not torturous. So, okay, what do you got? (laughs) What makes showering easier? Yes. So there's lots and lots of things. So my first question to the patient would be, okay, what is hard about showering? Let's say theoretically that it is the hot water makes the blood vessels uh, dilate and then makes the blood pool and then they get very dizzy. Okay, well then can we turn down the heat in the shower? If if OT said that to me, my answer would be no, we cannot. I want my shower hot. Fine, okay, then we figure out something else. Can you sit in the shower? Can we get you a shower chair? I always, always, always recommend shower chairs. I know a lot of patients are resistant to them because there's an idea of like, oh, this means something bad about me or that this is um, embarrassing that I have one. I think everyone in the world should just have one who doesn't love to shave their legs sitting down. I mean, come on, it's great. So I always recommend a shower chair. You can also get a detachable shower head. So if you're using the shower chair, it's not comfortable if your back is to the water, that the water is just pouring on your head. That's not comfortable. If you can get a detachable shower head, then you can control the stream of water over your whole body. You can turn the water off with a button as opposed to having to turn around and reach to turn it off. There are also long handled razors or sponges so you don't have to bend over to your feet. You can just reach down a little bit. So some people that bending over is a problem. Grab bars are a really important thing if you are somebody that maybe doesn't faint but just feels a little off balance, a little dizzy. We always recommend some sort of grip on the bottom of the shower if you are going to stand to prevent slipping. So there's a lot of things that you can do for showers. I even recommend not taking showers first thing in the morning. A lot of us feel really bad first thing in the morning. So can you shower at night? If the shower is calming to you, then maybe do it at night and part of your bedtime routine. So there's lots of different ways, but if you can't get in the shower, then sponge bathing is a perfectly acceptable option that you can do. So can I come back to this grocery store scenario? You had mentioned teaching someone to use a wheelchair. So does that mean that in their sessions with you, you would actually teach them like how to use a wheelchair, how to not bump into things, how to get around a grocery store? Because there actually sounds like a lot to that because you still have to reach things on the shelf. You still have to check out and now you might be kind of low for that. So it actually sounds like there's a lot to that. And that that's all something they do with you to perfect the fine skills. Yeah, the the fun thing about occupational therapy is that we will actually practice every single step of that. And depending on the setting that you get OT in, so whether it's home health or outpatient or if you're in a hospital, depends on if you can actually just go and do it in real life. If you're getting outpatient OT, many times it's potentially a possibility for you to actually go to the store and actually do it with, with your OT, which is a really neat opportunity. If the person is going to the grocery store by themselves and there's no one else with them, then I would recommend probably the motorized scooter just because you're going to have to push yourself. And if we're already fatigued, I'm not going to add pushing a wheelchair and while holding a basket on your lap by yourself like that just sounds like way too much. So a motorized scooter would probably be the easiest way. But if you have someone to go with you, can they push you in the wheelchair? Or does it make sense? Some people really just even need the cart to hang on to. Sometimes just holding on to that cart, if they're able to walk and their endurance is high enough, then maybe we just figure out ways to lean on the cart in a way that is safe, but helps them feel steady. If there's an issue with reaching up or reaching down to pick things up, depending on how heavy they are, we can use something called a reacher which is like a long piece of equipment that has like jaw clamp on the end that opens and closes like a Pac-Man mouth. 
and then there's a trigger you pull and it opens and closes and you can reach and pull things down. Now I wouldn't recommend that for like a can of soup that's heavy, but for a small bag of pasta or, you know, something like that would be totally fine. If none of that works, then let's look at the options of getting maybe your groceries delivered, or let's look at picking up your groceries at like curbside. So having going to a store where they gather your groceries for you and then bring them to your car. So there's lots of options, but it all just depends on the person's situation and their context and and their goals. If it's really important for someone to go and grocery shop themselves, then we're gonna make it happen. But if someone says, I don't really care about grocery shopping, I just need healthy food, then let's find an easier way to maybe take that out of their responsibility. So it, it just depends on the person. Yeah, it sounds like you get really intimately familiar with their specific life and how to just smooth whatever the challenges are for them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's imagine somebody conquered getting their groceries some way, somehow, and now they want to actually prepare a dinner, say, but they have orthostatic intolerance and heat intolerance. And I'm just going to make this really hard for you because I know you're a pro. Let's say they've got Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or joint hypermobility. And even just like using a knife is hard because the joints of their hand might experience pain. What do you got? What can you do? Is there hope for those of us like that? Yes, there is because that is me. I cook. So yes, there's lots and lots of hope. So let's start with the joint hypermobility problem because that's probably the easiest one to tackle. So if the knife is the problem, then we just get you a new knife. We'll get you what's called a rocker knife. So it's a knife, you'll hold it in a a gross grasp. So you'll hold it with your whole, your whole fist, the handle. And then the bottom is a almost half circle. And then you rock it back and forth and you use the motion from your shoulder, not your fingers. So in a normal knife, all the pressure and strength is coming from your fingers and your wrist. By using a bigger grasp, you can use your shoulder and your elbow, your bigger, stronger joints to get that strength to really cut it. So that's one option. Again, if if somebody says, well, I don't like a rocker knife, I'm, I really wanna use my specific knife. Well then great, we'll get you the figure eight splints and we will actually protect every single joint if we need to, we will, we can do that. It really just depends on what's important to the person. If someone says, I don't even care about cutting and I have the financial means to get pre-cut vegetables, well then great. We'll get you pre-cut vegetables at the grocery store. Or we have someone that says, I can't eat raw vegetables. And so we'll say, great, let's clean them. And then let's put them in the pot of water and boil them and put the whole vegetable in. We don't even need to cut it. Now, cutting it after it's cooked is going to be much easier. So it really just depends on how the person wants to do that. But there's lots and lots of options. In terms of orthostatic intolerance and cooking over a hot stove, I would say number one is cooking over a hot stove important to you. If the answer is yes, then we'll find a way to adapt it. If the answer is no, not really. I just, I don't really need to actively cook it. I just need the outcome. Okay, well then can we use a crock pot, right? You stick it in, you leave it there and then voila, it's magic. Can we look at an Instapot? There there are different options, but say someone says, no, I really wanna make this meal where I'm standing over the stove and cooking it. Then can we, first of all, get you a stool so you can sit down, number one. Number two, can we pre-prep the night before so that you're not standing as long? So you have all your prep done the day before, and then that's less time you have to stand. Can we cook it in stages so that you're not standing for 10, 15 minutes without a break? Can you do a step, sit down, do another step, sit down. And for each individual person, some people are going to say, well, no, I can't do that because I have two children and I need to get cooking done in this time period. And that's all I have. Okay, great. And we'll, we'll figure it out within that context. So I think that's one thing that makes OT so special is that we really know everything about that person's context. And then we use all of those different pieces to put together a solution. In terms of heat, There's lots of different things we can do. If again, my first thing would be, do you have to cook on the stove? Can we just get rid of that step? Um, Can we use the oven and you don't have to stand over top of it? Again, if they say, no, I want to. Okay, then there are cooling vests that you can wear. There's actually a lot of evidence to use those in patients with MS. I haven't seen any research done on patients with POTS with it, but um, I would imagine that it carry over and be effective. There are even just the little fans with like the cool water spray, that would be fine. There's those cooling neck towels 
that you can use. I mean, so really for us, we just have to figure out what's the person's context, what are the specific problems, and then we give multiple solutions. Yeah, that's great. It sounds so practical and so willing to work with people wherever they are. I have a question about how many occupational therapists know about POTS and does it even matter if they know about POTS or do they just care what your functional challenges are? Do you need to find someone who specializes in this or could most occupational therapists help you? Your first question is how many people know about this? I would say not as many as we want. A really exciting thing is that coming out, and I believe it's next year, there will be a whole special edition in an OT journal all about POTS. So that's a really big, exciting thing. Myself and some of my other OT research friends who also have POTS, we have done presentations at state associations, and we're really trying to get the word out. At Messiah University, where I work, my students do a research project every year. And the last several years that I've been working there, we've all been focused on OT's role with POTS. So I can guarantee that those 32 students in that cohort, every single person knows about POTS. So I, I think, is it as well known as we want it to be? No, it's not. But we're, we're getting there as, as best as we can, which is why we need more advocacy, right? We need people like you, Jill, who are doing this podcast to get the word out that, hey, POTS is a thing. This is important. In terms of do you need an OT that understands POTS to get good OT? As a patient, I would say, I think it's preferable to have somebody that's familiar with POTS. But as an occupational therapist, I would say that OT really focuses on the functional deficit. So if they can understand functionally what you cannot do, there's no reason why they can't give you really excellent treatment. I think some things that OTs would really need to know is that this is not a, oh, I'm tired. I just need to work on standing more. You know, <laughs> this is not like a, oh, I, I'm just weak and I, I can't stand and that's my problem. That's not the problem. It's orthostatic intolerance. So if they can get that part down, I really think that any OT could treat someone with POTS well. But I, I would encourage people with POTS who are seeking out an OT to bring them educational materials, give them an article or give them information. OTs are, in my experience, just very kind and generous. We go into this profession to help people. So if there's information that we can get to help our patients, we're going to want to learn about it. I would say as long as you have an OT who is willing to listen and to learn, you're going to be just fine. I, I would say steer clear of any healthcare practitioner who does not want to listen and does not want to learn. I, I would say turn around and go out that door. <laughs> that sounds like great advice. So if someone is listening to this and thinks they want to try some occupational therapy or OT, how does one go about getting access to it? Do you go through your doctor? Do you just call someone up in the yellow pages or Google them? How, how does it work? Yeah, so OTs need, just like most other rehab professionals, we need a doctor's prescription. So that just means that you would call your primary care doctor, it doesn't have to be your POTS doctor, and just say, hey, I would like to get OT. I'm unfamiliar with any doctor who would say, no, that's a bad idea. It's just that doctors don't think about it. They are very well trained on physical therapy. Oh yeah, yeah, go to physical therapy, but they kind of forget about us sometimes. So anytime I've been aware of a patient that has asked for it, doctors always said yes. There's nothing bad that can come out of OT. So I think if you have trouble doing some of your daily activities and you want tips and tricks on how to do it better, or you want a way to safely and slowly regain some of your lost skills, depending on your medication management and just how your health in general, then OT is a great idea. It, depending on your health depends on what setting you would get it in. So you can get occupational therapy in any healthcare setting. If you're in the acute care hospital, you can get OT there. Inpatient rehab, you can get it there. Most of the time though, POTS patients will probably get it in either outpatient or home health. So I just wanna explain the difference. So home health is when it's very, very difficult for you to leave the home. So the doctor will consider you, quote, homebound, and therefore the healthcare practitioners will come to you. So it might be a nurse, it might be an OT, a PT, et cetera. They'll come to you and give you services. However, the goal of home health is just to make you safe at home, and that's kind of it. So you're only going to get a short amount of therapy. You're not going to have months and months of it. Then there's outpatient therapy, and outpatient works two different ways. So the first way is that you go to the clinic, you go to the person, and they see you there. 
And those sessions usually last anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour. And you can be seen, you know, depending on your insurance for maybe a couple months, maybe a couple times a week. But there's also certain therapists and certain therapy companies that do outpatient, but bring it to you. So they'll come to your house, but you don't have to be homebound. So that is also an option. You may have to call around and see if you can find someone, but there are mobile therapists who will come to you. That's actually one of one of the jobs that I had when I when I was practicing before academia. So that's an option. So is it common for people to get two sessions a week for two months or one time ever or years or what what's kind of a normal progression of how this works for someone? Yeah, it really it really depends on a lot of different things. And unfortunately, it depends on insurance a little bit if you need insurance to cover it. So if you have Medicare, they are very, they love OT, they're very generous with OT and you can have it for a long period of time. Medicaid also covers OT. If you have private insurance, some private insurances only cover it for so many visits. So for example, like I looked up on my health insurance, just to give an example what it would be. And it's, it'd be $40 for a copay every session if I were to use my health insurance. That's expensive, right? I mean, that's a lot of money. A lot of people's insurance is maybe a $20 copay, just depends on your health care. But if insurance, assurance aside, pretending that didn't matter, it really depends on the person and their goal. So some people could be seen for four sessions total because they, they just need, you know, some tools, some tips, some tricks, and they're good to go. There are other people that are so debilitated, the, the 25% of us who can barely get out of bed, they may need months of therapy. It really just depends on sort of your starting point, your goals, where you want to get to, how consistent you are with the home program. So doing therapy once or twice a week is not going to magically heal you, right? To be clear, nothing will probably magically heal you. But (laughs) you need to follow up and do and, and use the tips and the tricks and do the exercises outside of therapy. So if you're someone who is willing to put in the work and willing to do that, you probably can get less therapy and pay less for it because you're doing that follow up. So it's hard to give like a this is the normal amount because it really varies per patient. But I would say an outpatient in general, two to three times a week for maybe two months is a very broad generalization. So other if there's any therapists that are listening to this and think, no, that's not true. I'm sure you are correct in your setting. I'm just giving a very, very broad generalization. <laughs> Right. Well, it sounds like that's one of the strengths of occupational therapy is that it can be so specific to the person and their goal. Is it is it usually based on a goal or a particular symptom? Like, for example, if you were my occupational therapist, would I set out and say, OK, here's my goal. I want to be able to do X, Y, Z. Or would I say, OK, fatigue is my biggest problem in all of life? Yeah. What is the scope of a OT project? Yeah, yeah. So in our evaluation, we do two things. We build what's called an occupational profile. So that's where we interview you and we get all types of information about your life history and and when you got sick. Were you always sick? What is really hard for you? What is really easy for you? What's a bad day look like? What's a good day look like? How are you managing your medications? What's your environment? Do you have stairs? Do you not have stairs? Do you go out to work? We ask you an insane amount of questions, right? So we build this profile all about you. And then we'll analyze, we'll actually watch you do the things that you say are hard. Now, we might simulate it. So if you're like, oh, I can't go grocery shopping. Like at that moment, I'm not going to take you to the grocery store, right? So I'll say, okay, like what's hard about grocery shopping? Oh, it's your balance, let's say. Okay, well, then maybe I'll do an assessment to test your balance so I have a baseline. Or maybe I'll test your strength. Or maybe I'll test your standing tolerance or your endurance or how do you how you put on compression socks or how you get up and down off of a toilet or whatever it is, right? I'm going to observe you and figure out what exactly is the problem, right? So after I do all of that, then I will give you the results and I'll say, okay, like, here's what I saw. Here's what you told me. What are your goals? What do you want to get out of this? And then we'll have a discussion and we're going to create goals together. So you'll say, okay, well, I really want to be able to, you know, fatigue is really awful for me. But I really want to be able to go to my friend's soccer game and not pass out, right? I'm making that up. Let's say that's your goal. Okay, fine. Well, then we're going to work towards that goal. 
So maybe we're going to do some adaptations. Maybe we're going to work on some endurance training. Maybe we're going to get you some adaptive equipment. Maybe we're, you know, on and on and on and on, right? So it's really goal-based, but what I love about OT is that we come up with the goals together. So you tell me generally what you want to be able to do, and then I figure out a way to make it happen. And then we're partners together. We, we then make it happen together. That sounds amazing. And I have to say, I've had this now for about 30 years, but back when I first had it, even just having someone to be supportive of the fact that I thought getting dressed was hard would have been amazing. Because I think in the beginning when it happens to you, especially if you're young, it feels kind of incredible. What's happening to me? Am I nuts? And knowing that this profession exists to just be practical and helpful, I feel like already is just such a boost. Uh, That's fantastic. So is there anything else you think our audience should know about occupational therapy? Anything that would help them understand it, find it, use it? I think specifically for those who have EDS and joint hyper or joint hypermobility syndrome, there are actually occupational therapists who specialize in the upper extremity and specifically the hands. So a lot of us with EDS have a lot of issues with our hands and a lot of pain. And there are therapists called certified hand therapists. So they do extra training. They take a really, really hard extra exam. And they're very, very skilled. So I would really encourage people who have EDS and joint hypermobility to really maybe consider that if you're having lots of hand pain, there are lots of different ways that they can help you strengthen the muscles around your joints to decrease your pain. There's lots of splints and, you know, adaptive devices, and they'll teach you joint protection techniques and lots of different things that will make your pain better. And that's something that I wish I would have known about before I went to school. That would have been something that I probably would have used myself if I would have known about it. The other thing I want to mention is I've been talking a lot about adaptation, but I also want to say that OT is not just adaptation. That's just one way. I just think with chronic illness, adaptation is generally an approach we're going to use heavily because it's chronic, right? But there is a lot of remediation we can do. So, I I mean, I know for myself, I have a lot of joint pain in my shoulders. My shoulders are really difficult for me in terms of a pain tolerance. So even just maintaining good strength in my arms and my back and my neck and maintaining and doing good exercises, OT can help you figure out what ways to do the exercises so that it's safe. It doesn't hurt you worse. That's a big thing. If we do exercises incorrectly, our pain will get worse. A lot of us also have bad proprioception. Like it's hard for us to tell where our body is in space. So like we can be standing or sitting in a way that's really bad for our bodies and that isn't, you know, ergonomic. So OTs can help with that. So there's lots of remediation and sort of strengthening, building endurance, building activity tolerance, fatigue management, lots and lots of different things as, as well. I just, we've talked heavily about adaptation based on our conversation, but that is a whole nother option if that's something you're looking for too. Well, that reminds me something that I come across in the nutrition world pretty often with our population is swallowing problems. And did you tell me once that you can even help someone kind of learn to be better at swallowing? So definitely not me because that's not my practice area and I would be clueless. But there are OTs who do specialize in that. I am the type of OT that because I know that's not in my skill set, I would always outsource to a speech and language pathologist and ask them to help with that. Because again, that's not in my skill set. But there are some OTs that can help with that. But that's sort of where speech and OT overlap a little bit. So depending on the therapist you have depends on if they would be comfortable or or trained, because that's not normally like a generalist skill, you would get extra training in that. So some people do have that extra training. But it's great to know that that skill set is even out there. Because in my experience, a lot of people start having problems swallowing, and they think that's just a skill they don't really get to have anymore. And so it's great to know that there's like a swallowing coach out there. And it makes me wonder what else, what other kind of specialists are out there. So that's great information. Anything else that we haven't covered yet? So I think I would encourage people with POTS to just know that you are not crazy and that your symptoms are not in your head and they are very, very real. 
And although, it, especially for those who are newly diagnosed, I've been there and I know it feels like it is the end of everything, but there are so many ways to manage your symptoms. It may not make them go away forever or perfectly, but there's ways to manage it so that you do have a good quality of life. So I just want everyone to hear that there is hope. I am um, an example of that. Jill is an example of that. There is, there is always hope. Oh, I think that's such wonderful advice because I think you're right. I think that with time, most of us just pick up little tricks and tips here and there that add up and make a huge difference and just gradually make everything a little better every time. And so that's great. Joanna, you are awesome. This is great information. Thank you for sharing it and for all the volunteer work you do to help patients through Dysautonomia Support Network. Where can people go if they want to check out everything that you're doing with your volunteer work? So you can find us at www.dysautonomiasupport.org. We are also on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, if you just look up Dysautonomia Support Network, that is our main page. And then we also have lots of support groups by region and then also by kind of lifestyle type things. So we have a wellness group. We have a creatives group that focuses on art and dance and journaling and, you know, all sorts of beautiful things. Our wellness group focuses on exercise and health and nutrition and meditation and, and all of those things. We have lots of other groups as well. We have a group specifically for college students, which is helpful, but our, our website is our main hub. And I do want to share that recently we published an assistive technology handbook, which will go through all of the tools that I've mentioned in this episode, pictures and, and descriptions and what um, symptoms they may be best used for. So keep an eye out for that. And then in the next couple months, we also have a Thriving in School K-12 handbook coming out, the College Thriving in College handbook coming out, and then a Thriving in the Workplace and how to use workplace accommodations coming out. So those should all be out. They are all in various draft form, but they are all, um, the first drafts are initially finished on all of those. So those should be coming out hopefully by the end of the summer. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you, Joanna. And to our audience, as always, please remember this is not meant as medical advice. Consult your medical team about what's right for you. But thank you for listening. Remember that you're not alone and please join us again soon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or on our website, www.standinguptopots.org slash podcast. And I would add, if you have any ideas or topics you'd like to suggest, send them in. You can also engage with us on social media at the handle Standing Up to Pots. Thanks for listening and we hope you join us. This show is a production of Standing Up to Pots.